A man who promised to get a woman home safe after a night out is found guilty of her murder. Edward Tenniswood targeted India Chip Chase outside a nightclub. He took her to his home where he killed her. Also this lunchtime, the housing crisis. It's not just London, why many people can't afford to buy in other cities too. Accused of trying to assassinate Donald Trump, we speak to the mother fighting to get her autistic son back to Britain to face justice here. And Ewan McGregor in Iraq, the actor on the children who've escaped danger but still need help. He'd been in the camp for only a week and he talked about his, his house being targeted and mortared, something we couldn't imagine, eh? This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. The man who murdered India Chip Chase had promised to get her home safe. She'd been on a night out in Northampton in January, but when she lost her friends, Edward Tenniswood made his move. Spotting her alone and in tears, he said he'd take her home. Instead, he took her to his house where he raped her, then killed her, and instead of calling for an ambulance, went out for a kebab. Ivor Bennett has the details. India Chip Chase had been on a night out with friends. All she wanted was to get home safe, but alone and vulnerable, she became a target. CCTV footage shows her outside the nightclub, crying and on the phone. That's when Edward Tenniswood closed in. He told her he'd get her home safe, but instead he lured her to a taxi. And this is where he brought her, the house where he lived and the place where he raped and murdered India on the night of January 30th. Neighbours say he rarely left these squalid surroundings, his computer covered in cling film, a room filled with newspaper cuttings of women who reminded him of ex-girlfriends. And the bedroom, where tennis would claim they'd shared a loving evening, but it was all a fantasy. She'd had a bit to drink, she was clearly quite upset, and um, he, taking on a paternal role, abused that um, position of trust that... You know, she obviously felt that she could trust him. Tenniswood said he killed India by accident, but instead of calling an ambulance, he left her and went out for a kebab. He was then seen drinking beer at a nearby hotel, where he even used the computer to check news sites for progress on the search for her. Officers arrested him there the next day. He said, I suppose you've been to the house. You've found what you're looking for. They found India's body where he left her with more than 30 injuries and Tenniswood's blood under one of her fingernails. In a statement recorded for the court, India's father spoke on behalf of a family that's been torn apart. Whatever happened that night, the fact is my daughter was murdered. I sincerely hope that there is no possibility that any other woman ever suffers at the hands of my daughter's murderer. The jury took less than two hours to find Tenniswood guilty of murder a man who targeted a vulnerable young woman who just wanted to go home. Ivor Bennett, ITV News. Edward Tenniswood will be sentenced later this afternoon. We'll have the details and reaction on the ITV Evening News at 6.30. Next, the AIDS charity that took on the NHS and won. The High Court ruled today that a drug that has been shown to prevent HIV will now be funded by the health service. Drugs companies say PrEP will cost £400 per person per month. Campaigners say the ruling is a game changer. Critics say it's the wrong use of NHS money and will discourage people to practice safe sex. I'm joined by Deborah Gould, the chief executive of the National AIDS Trust, which took the case to court. Thank you for coming in. How effective has this drug PrEP been in terms of fighting both HIV and further down the line AIDS? It's incredibly effective. There was a clinical trial in the UK called PROUD and it found that if you take it properly, it's 100% effective. It showed 86% overall on the trial, but the people that 
contracted HIV weren't taking it properly. OK, so it's a big problem. It needs tackling. This drug, though, is a prevention, not a cure, which is why some people are arguing it shouldn't be funded on the NHS. And yet the NHS fund all kinds of other preventative technologies. So they do things around weight loss, they do things around diabetes, you know, they do vaccines. So it, it isn't a question of whether or not the NHS overall can fund prevention. Actually, Sir Simon Stevens, the chief exec of the NHS, has prioritised prevention because ultimately it's better and cheaper than treatment. It's just about whether they can fund this specific thing through the very specific type of funding that they were looking at. And we're really dis delighted that the judges agreed with us that they do have the power to do that. There is another way to stop getting HIV, and that is to practice safe sex. Do you think that there is a danger, at least, that this will discourage from people from doing that? Well, the evidence shows that it doesn't. So in the PROUD trial, they compared the levels of sexually transmitted infections to people at the same level as risk taking PrEP and not taking PrEP, and they were largely the same. And one of the really great things about PrEP is it means that people who are at high risk regularly go and meet with their sexual health clinician to talk about how they can manage their risk. And what it means is that people who aren't protected in other ways can behave responsibly and protect themselves by taking PrEP. All right. OK, Deborah Gould, thank you very much for coming to talk to me. Thank you. The number of people in the UK who own their home has fallen to its lowest level for 30 years. Research from the Resolution Foundation, an independent organisation which works to improve living standards, found soaring house prices in several cities and making property increasingly unaffordable for struggling buyers. Greater Manchester has seen the sharpest fall. Sharon Thomas has more. A home of our own, something most of us have always aspired to. Now, an increasing number of would-be buyers are having to abandon their dream as an unprecedented rise in house prices forced many of us out of the market. Home ownership is now at its lowest level for 30 years. In London, astronomical increases are well documented, but now new research from think tank The Resolution Foundation shows the crisis has spread to every part of the UK. In Manchester, home ownership fell by 14.5% to just under 58%. Outer London has seen the second biggest drop to just under 58%. The trend was also seen across other parts of the UK. In Northern Ireland, home ownership has fallen to 63% and there was a slightly smaller drop in Wales to 70%. We've known about the housing crisis for years and for many this has been a London-focused problem. But our research shows that cities across the north of England are experiencing similar declines in home ownership. So it's a huge problem across the country. Uh, millions of potential homeowners struggling to get on the housing ladder and this is really something the government needs to do something about. One of the things we need to do is to build more homes. That's the fundamental way to deal with house prices going up. But we've also done a huge amount as a government to help people. They help to buy scheme, shared ownership, starter homes coming online. And what we've seen actually from the latest data is that this decline in the proportion of people that own their own home, which started back in 2003, has now um, been halted and there's more to do. We need to reverse it to ensure as many people as possible get the chance to own their own home. With house prices now at around seven times the average income, there are fears Britons will increasingly become a nation of renters. Sharon Thomas, ITV News. Our deputy political editor, Chris Chip, joins us now from Westminster. Chris, do you think housing is going to become a priority for the Prime Minister now? I think, Nina, it is. I mean, you would have heard Theresa May say many times since she became Prime Minister that we need an economy that works for everyone. But she also said before she became Prime Minister that we had to deal with the country's housing deficit. Otherwise, she said house prices will continue to rise and young people will find it even harder to own their own homes. The big question, of course, is what is she going to do about it? Well, one of the things she is doing this afternoon, she's chairing a cabinet committee on the economy and industrial strategy. It all sounds rather dry. It's the first time that she's uh, chaired this particular cabinet committee. It's got 10 cabinet ministers sitting around it, and they will look at things like pay, like jobs and like housing. All of, th all of those things, of course, are related. And I think what we've seen perhaps more clearly in this report than ever is that pay has been going up by 2%, but house prices by 14%. And the big problem that every government, successive governments, have failed to deal with is that demand is outstripping supply, and the only way to correct that is to build more homes. Indeed. Chris Shipp, thank you. Still to come. I really passionately believe we've got to keep 
Sorry. Ewan McGregor's exclusive report on the children he met inside Iraq's refugee camps. And a victory for one of Britain's most promising cyclists, why Lizzie Armistead will now ride in Rio. First, the mother of the British man accused of trying to assassinate Donald Trump is pleading for him to be allowed to serve justice here rather than America. Michael Sanford from Surrey is autistic. The 20-year-old has been in custody since June after allegedly trying to steal a police officer's gun during a Republican rally. It's just over six weeks since Thank Michael you, Sanford was detained by police at this Republican rally in Las Vegas. Led out to the sound of boos from Donald Trump's supporters, the presidential nominee himself didn't seem that phased. Uh, we love our police. But if found guilty, the 20-year-old who has autism and severe mental health problems could face up to 30 years in an American prison. His mum, Lynn, says he's already struggling in custody and simply wouldn't be able to cope. It's been a horrendous time for both us and for him. Um, very, very difficult, very distressing for all concerned. Um, but I've confirmed to Michael that we haven't abandoned him. Court documents show that Michael visited a firing range the day before the rally and said he'd planned to kill Trump. But Lynn believes it was a bizarre incident motivated by his mental health conditions, not malice. She says she doesn't want him to escape punishment, but that he needs to be near his family in order to get better. The foreign office are in contact with the family's legal team. Michael is due to stand trial in three weeks' time. You saw her briefly there, Lynn Sanford joins me now. What has the past few weeks been like for you? Uh, pretty horrific, yeah. Um, I've finally been able to speak to Michael on the phone, which was something I hadn't been able to do until recently. It was very bittersweet to hear his voice. You know, we were both very choked, but it's a lifeline to him. Um, but to hear that he's really, really struggling to cope is very concerning for me. You haven't been able to see him, though? You've just no. had a phone call? Even if I was able to go out and visit, uh, visit him, it would still be via video link from the prison. Which must be incredibly hard, because we do Extremely hear things difficult. in voices, but in facial expressions, much yeah. more. What was it like to get that phone call that day to say, this is what's happened and this Every is what your Every parent's worst to? nightmare. You know, I just could not believe it. He's never had a malicious bone in his body. You know, he's never hurt anybody other than himself. And uh, I just couldn't get my head around it. And to the best of your knowledge, he didn't have a big interest in politics, either here or abroad? Not any interest in politics whatsoever. Nobody that has known him has mentioned to me that he had. Some people have said, could you have stopped him from going abroad? But he's 20. Yep, uh, we did try desperately. The GP, the mental health services, the police, they all noted our concerns and were concerned as well. But they said he's an adult. Oh, you can't stop him. And in terms of the fight now to get him back, you want him to face justice. You're not saying he should get away Definitely with what he's being not, accused no. of. Given his history of, of um, mental health problems and autism, do you think that the American authorities will listen to your plea and, and there will I be hope so, a case for him? I hope so, because where he is at the moment, um, and he's facing 30 years in jail, he's in isolation 22 hours a day and currently on suicide watch. I mean, that's not conducive to anybody's mental health. You know, and I fear that he will commit suicide in prison you know, if we don't get him back here and get him psychiatric help. How do you cope with that fear that that is something that you're having to deal with day after day and you're building up now to his trial in a few weeks' time. I'm just putting all my focus and all my energies into letting him know that we still love him and we will do everything that we can to fight for him to get a fair outcome. And is the Foreign Office doing everything they can to help you in this situation? As far as I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lynn Sanford, thank you very much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Ewan McGregor has visited a refugee camp in northern Iraq, seeing for himself how families are forced to live and how children seem to cope with being homeless, hungry and afraid. Many have survived bomb attacks, all have managed with few facilities, all the while with more and more refugees arriving at the camp. The actor was there for UNICEF. Here is his exclusive report for ITV News. So, I came to uh, northern Iraq and I've spent three days going round different camps. The first day we, we looked at a camp that was uh, housing Syrian refugees, and then yesterday and today we're looking at camps with internally displaced people fleeing from the violence in Iraq. So I've been really impressed and moved by the, the families I've met, how their most important thing in their world, even though they've lost their world, if you like, is to be together 
how, how important that is, to the point where I've met families who say it doesn't matter that our houses are gone, that our villages are rubble, <laughs> we're together and that's all that really matters. And that's been very touching and moving for me. And then just seeing the scale of it, they're putting electricity cables in, they're digging new toilets for the thousands and thousands of other refugees they're expecting to arrive. It's kind of unbelievable. We, I really passionately believe we've got to keep... Sorry. It's just we kids, you know, like ours. There was a little boy we met yesterday whose eyes were very glazed and he, he'd been in the camp for only a week and he talked about his, his house being targeted and mortared. So they had to leave. But he was like six, seven. It was an extraordinary thing to hear. Something we couldn't imagine, eh? It's true that there's a, there can be an attitude in, in Britain which has been perpetuated by politicians that people are, are coming to our country because they'd be better off and they, they're sort of breaking down our doors to try and flood in. And the truth is that people here have let, have, we've heard extraordinary stories of people running with their child while, with, through sniper fire, people fleeing across rivers with babies, not because they think they can come and get money out of our government in Britain, but because, they, because there's no other choice. I've never felt more confused and upset by what I've seen, but also driven that it's just clear they've got to try and help, you know, okay. because it's monumentally massive, this problem here. Millions of children are in dire straits here. We can't just think it's not our problem. We've got to try and help. I think it's just, it's easy not to really see it and to keep it out here, but I would try and go home and make sure people bring it back in front of their vision. Ewan McGregor in Iraq for UNICEF. I'm joined now by the charity's executive director, Mike Penrose. We're used to seeing celebrities visit places like this, but Ewan McGregor seemed genuinely shocked, moved, surprised by what he'd seen there. Absolutely. And, and when you visit the, the places like the camp he visited and really experience and talk to the children who've suffered some horrendous things, it's very difficult not to be moved by it. Th th these are children who, as Ewan quite rightly said, have run through sniper fire, have seen their homes and their livelihoods destroyed. A and facing that and not becoming emotional is very, very difficult. Um, you know, the figures are astonishing. One in five children in Iraq, about 3.6 million, are right now in danger. As Ewan McGregor says, we just can't imagine what that feels like to have our children be in that position on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, one thing that Ewan said that really stuck out for me is we, we dehumanise these children a lot by calling them refugees or migrants. They're children. They're children who have suffered horrendous uh, abuses. So many, as you said, UNICEF estimates that 3.6 million are acutely vulnerable right at the moment. And it's almost impossible to imagine what they're going through. It's not just Iraq, though, is it? No. It's in other countries around the world that are in conflict or are in hideous situations. So it's very difficult for our government and our country to continually help. What more can be done? Well, the thing we're calling on the British government to do immediately, there are at least... 140 children at the moment in Calais alone who have the right to be in the UK. They have family here and we're calling on the government to reunite them immediately before the school year starts so they don't miss out on education. But we can also look around in all the camps across Europe and across the Middle East for children that are vulnerable, alone and isolated and target them first because they're the ones we can help. And presumably one simple thing you can do is when you've got children who've been separated from their families that you can try and reunite them and as Ewan said they have some semblance of a family life out there. Absolutely. Family reunification is, is a basic principle for UNICEF. As soon as we know where a family member is we try and put them together. But we need more help and support to do that. We need 100, another 170 million this year alone just to fulfil these basic rights. Mike Penrose, thank you very much. Thank you. The Home Office has won a legal challenge against four Syrian refugees living in a camp in Calais who won the right to stay in Britain. In January, a judge ruled that the three teenagers and a 26-year-old man should be brought to the UK to escape intolerable conditions and uphold their right to a family life. But today, the government appeal was allowed, although the men won't face deportation. 
and thousands of people are gathered at Rouen Cathedral in France this lunchtime for the funeral of the 85-year-old priest murdered last week. Father Jacques Hamel was one of six people taken hostage by two men who had pledged allegiance to the so-called Islamic State. The others survived. The British cyclist Lizzie Armistead has been cleared to compete in the Rio Olympics after winning an appeal against an anti-doping rule violation. The London 2012 silver medalist faced being suspended for three failures relating to her whereabouts which led to her missing drugs tests. Our sports reporter Amy Lewis is live in Rio for us. Good news then for one of Britain's medal hopefuls. Yes, yeah, she was the first British athlete to win a medal in London 2012 and she's a favourite to win gold here in Rio. But she did face being banned for two years after she had missed those three tests in the space of 12 months. She did accept two of them as her mistake, but she had challenged one of them and she's been successful in that. And it's understood it's because there was a receptionist that didn't let the tester up to her room. So she was test was meant to be happening. In a statement, she has said the following. She said, I've always been and will always be a clean athlete and have been vocal in my anti-doping stance throughout my career. I am very much looking forward to putting this situation behind me and firmly focusing on Rio again after what has been an extremely difficult time for myself and for my family. We can't get away from this issue of doping at this Olympics. What's the latest on the Russian athletes today? Well, I spoke to one Russian official who told me that in the athletes' village just over here that uh, the athletes were having sleepless nights. They've already been cleared to compete, but they're concerned that they still might be sent home. Obviously, there's still the athletes that are back in Russia who've already been banned. Some of them are trying to get their bans overturned. It includes Yula Etomova, who's a world champion swimmer, and 17 Russian rowers who are uh, attempting today to try and get their bans overturned. We will find out later if they have been successful. Amy Lewis, thank you. And if you want more details on the Olympics, what's happening when and the Brits to look out for, head to itv.com slash news. That's all this lunchtime. Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin will be here with the ITV Evening News from everyone here for now. Bye-bye.